tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hey there, friend. Glad you made it by. Man, you were drunk as hell last week. <laughs> nah, don't worry. You didn't do anything too embarrassing. Now, Chester here... <laughs> He's a different story. Sometime after dark there, I caught him climbing on top of a feral hog. <laughs> then he gets pissed off when I put the picture on Instagram. <laughs> hey, Chester. I took it down, man. Oh, well. Come on in, friend. He'll be all right. He'll get over it. Mm. Uh, you know... I was planning to dry out a little after St. Patrick's Day last week, but it just so happens today is another holiday. That's right, March 24th, National Cocktail Day. <laughs> and plus, I just had my own birthday on the 21st, so drying out just ain't an option this week, y'all. Oh, well, far be it for me not to observe. I've got way too much regard for that. All right, so smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom, friends. Because old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, a word from our sponsors. This is Season 1, Episode 26 of Drew Blood's Dark Tales. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. To show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today and get instant access from our friends at Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Oh yeah, and we are accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Hey, wasn't it supposed to be season two yet? Hmm. Oh, well, maybe next week. Next week, season two. Anyway, tonight we've got a wild one. In 1987, Kenny, a giant eyeball encased in a block of ice, told Alexander Calder he could reunite him with his deceased father. All he had to do was climb inside his refrigerator and shut the door. Now, 26 years later, Kenny is back. So, without further delay, I give you, from author C.L. Horton, Calder. I'm always cold. It doesn't matter what the temperature is outside or inside. I'm always cold. My wife and I constantly battle over the thermostat in the house. If it's summer, I still want the heat on. If it's winter, I can't turn the heat up high enough. The fact that I'm always cold hasn't made things very easy on me either with a moniker like colder. Talk about a walking stereotype. Oh, my name is Alexander Calder, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Sometimes, depending on how old the person is that I'm meeting for the first time, they think I'm saying Alexander Calder instead of Calder. Oh, like the artist they'll beam? No, it's Calder, I'll correct them. They always look disappointed for some reason. Why? Why would it matter to somebody if Calder was my last name or not? The man died a year before I was born. Why in the world would they think that I was him or that I was named after him? I'm not a miniature or kinetic sculptor from the 1960s. Besides, what type of weirdo was hoping for someone's last name to be different from what it was? If I ever met somebody with the first name Harrison, I wouldn't say, Oh, so your last name isn't Ford? And then look all disappointed about it. Anyway, I guess I should get to the point. 
I remember the exact time I started feeling this way. Cold, that is. A deep, pervasive, inside-the-bones type of cold. I was in the fifth grade when I got trapped inside a refrigerator. I almost died. How could that have happened, you may ask? Well, that's where my life gets strange. I was downstairs in my childhood home's basement grabbing my stepdad a beer back in 1987. Once I was down in the basement, I walked a clear paved path that's only blemish was a small drain opening in its middle towards the refrigerator that sat at the far end of the wall. Then I heard a voice. Except, I guess it wasn't a voice that I heard as much as I felt it. This voice came across me like a knowing. It was as if everything the voice wanted to say had already been said, and it was known to me. It was like having a conversation that lasted an hour in a single minute. It's hard to explain. Even today, 26 years later, it's hard to explain. But it's the truth. If I could describe it somehow, imagine a glass that was filled a quarter of the way full with water and that my mind was a sponge. The rest of the empty glass was all the knowledge I could know, but only the water that was in the glass was what the refrigerator wanted me to know. So my brain, the sponge, gets placed into the glass and absorbed all the water, which was what I was supposed to know. That's how the information seemed to transfer to me. Weird, I know. It gets weirder. It was Kenny who was giving me this information. Kenny was the refrigerator. Except he wasn't just any ordinary refrigerator. No. Kenny was sort of like a refrigerator, an alien entity, a spaceship, and a time machine all rolled up into one. Kenny let me know he could take me anywhere I wanted to go or anywhere I could think about going. When I asked him or thought to him, how I could go to these places. He said for me to open up the refrigerator and I'd find out. So I did. I opened the refrigerator. It was light outside, but the light that beamed out from the refrigerator door being opened was brighter. The light shining out from the refrigerator made the daylight shining in from the outside seem like darkness in comparison. The refrigerator was old. Even back in 87, it was old. And when you opened up the door to the top of the freezer, the refrigerator portion was exposed at the same time. So you had this dichotomy of darkness at the top where the freezer was, mixed with this blinding light at the lower half of the fridge. The freezer portion of the refrigerator was so cold that there was a thick fog of frost that hit its contents. The frost seemed to swirl and dance on the powerful light shining from below. When the cold air eventually settled in the basement, the contents of the freezer were finally revealed to me. I found myself facing a gigantic green eyeball encased in a large block of ice in the freezer. This was Kenny. The eye moved around in the ice like a socket, not frozen into place. The eye was fairly normal looking except for its large size. The iris was green and round. The pupil was an abyss of black. Some veins seemed to spread out from the white of the eyes and into the ice, but not too far out. Not far enough to be connected to the freezer anyway. I don't know why, but I wasn't scared of the strange sight. Kenny let me know to look out the door of the basement that faced out into the backyard, and I did. The daylight was gone, and so was my backyard. The summer day that had been there before seemed to have been replaced by a futuristic city that could only be described as purple, metallic, and glowing. The wonderful city seemed to peek out over orange and yellow clouds. Kenny let me know that this was one place that I could go. I wondered to him what it was, and he let me know it was a possibility. What type of possibility, I wondered to him. One 
of many. Can he let me know? Could you show me more possibilities? I wondered. Sure. Can he let me know? And he did. There were millions of possibilities, places, and a million times inside and besides those possibilities, and places that ran through my thoughts as to where I could go. Some places can he let me know about. Some places were ones I had just made up. And some places were thoughts that other people had made up. Some possibilities were here on this planet and some were on other planets. Some places were far off and some places were nearby. I don't know how I knew this. I don't know how Kenny knew how to let me know this, but he did. One world had white trees and grass where the skies were green, the oceans were emerald, and the inhabitants of the planet were made out of a reflective skin that always let them see themselves in others. And it was known to me that there were peace and understanding on that planet. Some planets were dark, scary, and cold. Some worlds were nothing but death and despair. Some worlds were dark but held you like a warm blanket. Some worlds were bright, but were harsh and barren. One world was bright and dark, and it seemed like it was on the brink of creation and nothingness all at the same time. Some worlds were small, smaller than a pin top. Then other worlds were bigger than our entire reality. These were all known to me. Then some of these worlds were not just beside ours, but were instead spread out seemingly in all direction. I think Kenny was helping me process all of the possibilities of where we could go, because even now when I try to concentrate on all the possibilities of what could be and what would be, it was like looking out into the universe in all directions through the eyes of a fly that were mirrored, and those eyes were in turn staring back out at themselves from all directions, in and out from all points of reality, from dimensions in and out of space and in and out of time. I think I saw what some people have always wanted to see. Not just the universe, but every universe. I think I saw all all was known to me. In all that there was, Kenny said I could go to any of these possibilities that I wanted to. I just had to choose one. I wondered to Kenny if I could go to one of these worlds in particular. Of course there were worlds and places that might have been more exciting and adventuresome. However, none of them mattered to me more than the one I focused on. It wasn't that far away, and it wasn't that long ago. I chose the place where my dad was still alive. After seeing all that there was, it wasn't that hard of a decision for a 10-year-old kid who missed his dad to make. Kenny let me know he could get me there. Kenny let me know all I had to do was climb inside the refrigerator. I couldn't climb inside though because the metal racks were still inside the fridge leaving no room for me to get inside. I know what you're thinking, a time machine with a design flaw this obvious should have sent some danger signals out into my mind. Cut me some slack, I was ten. I don't know why exactly but I still believed Kenny, mainly because I wanted it to be true. Well. The metal racks to the refrigerator were still blocking my way, so I took the racks out and got inside. I waited. Nothing happened. Kenny let me know that I needed to shut the door. So I did. I shut the door and still nothing happened. Nothing happened except I couldn't breathe. You would think I would have panicked or I would have screamed for help, but I didn't. I just waited. I waited to go to the place where my parents and I were happy. Where we were all a family again. Wherever in the universe it was where my dad hadn't died when I was five. Wherever it was in the all where my dad was alive and well and I could finally go and see him again. I wanted that so very badly. I want that now. 
except I didn't go anywhere. I just found myself trapped inside a refrigerator suffocating to death. And I did it with a smile on my face. I honestly don't remember anything until the paramedics woke me up. They said I had died, but I didn't remember anything. I didn't remember anything but Kenny. And that's where I messed up. I should have never told anyone about Kenny. Boy, was that a mistake. As it turns out, there aren't too many people who have had conversations with their refrigerators, especially ones with giant green eyeballs frozen in huge blocks of ice in the freezer. Who knew? I wish I had known because I spent the next five years going to every type of psycho whatever is you could imagine until I smartened up and realized that the truth or at least what I believed to be the truth, was the last thing in the world anyone ever wanted to hear from me. I finally smartened up and just told everyone that I had made Kenny up. I had made Kenny up and I told everyone I didn't know why. I told them I thought I just wanted to make an excuse as to why I got inside that refrigerator to begin with. Everyone was so relieved, especially my mom and stepdad. Now I was normal again and everything could go back to the way it had been before I had almost unwittingly killed myself. All I had to do was lie and everything went back to business as usual. At least for everyone but me. I won't bore you with all the details of growing up. Needless to say... To be known as the kid who almost offed himself in his refrigerator didn't help me too much in the popularity department. In elementary school, I was the refrigerator boy. In middle school, the term blue balls got thrown around more than a few times in my direction. By the time I hit high school, though, I was just colder. Which could have been worse, I admit it. Except... Having your last name used as an intended insult, well, that's almost impossible to get around. Colder, colder. I could still hear the kids saying my name in that mocking, humiliating tone. The tone that people say to ignore because you're being too sensitive. Near as I could tell it, sensitive's new definition should be changed to putting up with everyone's bullshit and inadequacies. I went off to college, and I met a nice girl who didn't know my situation about the refrigerator. We just hit it off right from the start about my second week in school. I ended up dropping out of college after two years and just never went back. I had majored in art, but I didn't like it as much as I thought I would. Even though I didn't finish school, those student loans didn't disappear, and I ended up getting a job when I moved back home. I'm not going to tell you what that job is yet, because sometimes I can't even believe how ironic it is, but it's a living. My girlfriend, Shannon Lane, continued in school and got her degree. It wasn't always easy, but Shannon and me, we beat the odds, and we made the long-distance relationship thing work. Shannon graduated. She came back here to Virginia to be with me and we eventually got married. We bought a little house together about three blocks from where I had grown up. That was about ten years ago now, and we have two little boys, Jacob and Joshua. They're great, my life's great, and I'm really happy now. Until this thing happened to me the other day. I wrapped up the day selling to Stevenson's a stainless steel K-Cold 5000. South Korea's finest top-of-the-line refrigerator. To sell one of these babies, you're considered a silver dragon slayer because they're so hard to slay or sell in this case. I was bundling up to head home when Mr. Kruger, my boss, walked up to me to congratulate me on the sale. Yeah, I'm a refrigerator salesman. It's like Van Gogh selling hearing aids. I know, I've heard it all before. I don't know how the hell you did it, Colder. You couldn't get change out of that jerk Stevenson's pocket if he was drowning. But you managed to do it somehow. Good job, he said and patted me on the back. 
I liked Mr. Kruger. He was a good guy, and he was a good boss. The last few years had been sort of shaky at the store financially, but we seemed to be having a better time of it this year. Slaying a few more silver dragons could help us all. It was cold outside, and of course, I was freezing like always. I wore two jackets, two shirts, two pairs of pants, two socks, basically doubling up on anything I could think of to try and stay warm. I got into my car shivering because I was so cold and waited for the engine to warm up. Then he was there. I don't know why I didn't jump out of the car at the sight of some strange guy just sitting there in the passenger seat. I don't even know how he got inside the car because he wasn't there when I first got into it. I think not anyways, and I knew that I hadn't seen the car door open and close. Weird. Even weirder is that this stranger that was in my car didn't look at me directly. He continued to just stare out the front window. Looking him over, I noticed he had his seatbelt on, and even though I was just looking at him in profile, I got a strange feeling that I knew this guy somehow. Good on the job, slaying dragon. The guy said, Thanks? Um, can I ask you a question? I said, Not sure why. He said, I guess that was a yes to my question. Then this guy turned to look at me. It was horrifying. This guy's eyes were like two large white orbs that had been thrown into his eye sockets, but somehow hadn't managed to go all the way through his skull. It was like these moistened half-white circles had just lodged into his face, leaving him with this constant, overly exaggerated look of surprise on his features. Stretching out from his bulging white eyes, there was this webbed, cracked-looking skin. Like when glass has been shattered when something has been thrown through it. But the skin looked like skin and not slick and hard as glass does. It was disconcerting and I jumped a little when I was finally facing him. Who are you? I said. This guy looked toward the window again. He smiled and his teeth were not the normal white color. Do you know how teeth are separate from the gums? At least that it looked that way anyway. There's a distinctive pinkish color and then their teeth. Well, this guy's teeth were completely different from any other pair of teeth I had ever seen before because his gums were gray and they were stretched down the length of his teeth until they were just at the very end. You saw these opaque beige daggers. His smile reminded me more of stubby fingers with sharply pointed nails at the ends more than they did of teeth. Matter doesn't, it does, really. This guy said. He talked so bizarrely, I considered the possibility that he might be mentally challenged somehow. Maybe he escaped from where he was staying. Perhaps his family is missing him. I'll have to look into it. Kinda does, I said. Why? The guy turns to look at me. You don't know who you are, even know. I looked away. He's not threatening, just the opposite. He's very mild-mannered in his actions, but his face... There's no other way to put it. His face was a nightmare. I just couldn't force myself to look at him for more than a moment at a time. It's okay, understand I. Keep I'll just here out looking. And he turned to face the windshield again. I don't have any money if that's what you want, I said. The weird guy just laughed. No, want the money I don't need your... What? I thought to myself. Then there's a knocking on my car door window. It's Mr. Kruger, and he was rubbing his hands together to stay warm. I rolled down my window, and white gusts of cold air appeared from his mouth as he talked. You still here, Colder? Yeah, I just, uh... 
and I looked over to the strange guy sitting in my car, but he's not there anymore. Mr. Kruger looks at me confused. Just what? It's getting late, Colder. Your wife just called me. She's getting worried about you. You forget your cell phone? What? It's only... And I reached in my pocket and looked at my cell phone. Man, it was already 7.30 p.m. There were three missed call alerts and messages. I was supposed to have been home over an hour ago. But that's impossible. I just got out of work and haven't been in this car more than... How long had I been out here? Are you feeling all right, Colder? Said Mr. Kruger. Yeah. I mean, yes. Yes, sir. I must have just lost track of time, that's all. The phone must have been muffled in my jacket. Didn't hear it go off. Mr. Kruger gave me a concerned smile. All right, then. I'll see you tomorrow. Make sure you call the wife. She sounded pretty worried. Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> and he waved at me and turned to head back into the store. I returned the wave and then rolled up the window to the car. I looked over and thankfully the strange guy still wasn't there. But I did happen to notice the passenger seatbelt was still fastened. Shannon wasn't very happy with me when I called. I apologized and told her I was sick. When I finally got home, I went to bed early. I woke up later on that night in a dead sweat. That's unusual for me because I never sweat. I was freezing. The cold air mixing with my drenched skin. Shannon apologized because she hadn't believed me about being sick, but one look at me and she changed her mind. Not sure if I would consider the condition I was in good luck or not, but it helped ease the tension of me being so late and getting home. A little bit anyway. I took a hot shower hoping to warm up a little bit. It didn't help. I went downstairs because I knew I was keeping Shannon up. I didn't want to add her not getting a good night's rest to the growing list of my sins against her. I went downstairs into the kitchen and I fixed myself a cup of coffee. If I'm going to be awake anyway, I might as well stay warm and awake. At least as warm as I can get anyway. The coffee was good and right after I took a sip I suddenly heard a noise in the basement. I ignored it. It was probably just a house settling. Then I heard it again, but this time the sound was a little louder. I decided to go downstairs and check it out for myself. I clicked on the light to the basement and I walked down the stairs. When I reached the bottom of the steps, I saw him there. I should have been scared because there was an intruder inside my home, but I wasn't. It was that guy again. The weird guy from the car, and he was inside my home now. He was just standing there in the room in a weird spot. When you stand in a room, some spots feel like this is a good area to stand. The middle or at least the near the room center. But this weird guy, he stood in the spot in the room that made the least sense. Near to and facing just slightly towards the back wall. What the hell are you doing here? I said in a whispered yell. Here for you this time again. I've been waiting for a long time, you for The guy said. He turned and that thing he called a face just made me look downwards. I'm sorry. This is my house. I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Then I looked up and the guy who was standing about five feet away from me before was suddenly standing right next to me. Let's leave, yes. Me with... You back me with need go to. Back where? To belong you not here, don't you? You don't. Alex? Said Shannon. I turned to face my wife. She looked so surprised. I guess I would too if I found my husband standing in the middle of the basement talking to a weird guy. Except that's not what Shannon saw. She saw me talking to nobody and it seemed that I had said some things I don't remember. And to top things off, 
I had said these things in words that she didn't understand. I only remembered the little exchange that I had with the weird guy. It was only a few sentences to my reckoning. She had watched me talking for almost five full minutes to myself before she said something to me. I blamed the incident on me waking up in the middle of the night, which I never do. I said I must have been half awake or half asleep. Take your pick. Add to that being sick and, well, I said anything I could think of so my wife wouldn't think I was crazy as a shithouse rat. I think it worked. At least she let me believe my excuses worked. With good reason. Shannon was still properly annoyed with me in the morning. I promised I'd make it up to her and I went to work. The day went fairly well. I made a couple of sales and there were no strangers in my car after work. Things were going better. I took the kids in that night. Shannon and I went to bed and then I began to dream. I dreamed I was at my mom's house and I went down into the basement where the refrigerator was. I wasn't in 1987, though. It was the present day because I could see that I was wearing the clothes that I had gone to bed in. I was wearing my old Weezer t-shirt left over from my college days, pulled over a long-sleeved knitted shirt and checkered flannel pants. Alex? said my mom. I saw she was in her bed clothes, too. Yeah, I said casually. What on earth are you doing here, sweetie? Are you... Are you bleeding? Then I suddenly realized I wasn't dreaming. I was standing in my mom's basement staring at the refrigerator I had almost died 26 years ago in. I was so cold I could barely move. I looked around and was surprised to see bloody footprints on the basement floor. I followed them from the outside door over to where I was standing and I saw that I was fixed to the floor in a pool of my frozen blood. From the crimson puddle, slightly frosted with ice, a small blood trail led towards the drain that sat in the middle of the basement floor's walkway leading towards the fridge. I looked back over and saw that the window pane had been busted out the basement door. I must have broken it, turned a deadbolt, and I must have cut my feet on the glass when I walked inside. Even if I hadn't cut my feet on the glass, if I had walked the three blocks to my mom's house barefoot, which I'm pretty sure that I had, I'm sure my feet hadn't been in that good a condition to begin with. I don't remember doing any of that, though, and I'm not exactly sure how long I'd been inside my mom's house. However, it was 4 a.m. by the time I made it back home. I was cold, too. Colder than I think I'd ever been in my entire life. That's saying something. Shannon wasn't very sympathetic to my situation, though. She was more than pissed. She was furious. I didn't know what to tell her. I said I guess I had become a sleepwalker. I didn't go back to bed because I didn't trust myself. How could I? I had built up enough vacation days to take some time off from work, and Mr. Kruger was fine with it. I did some work I'd been putting off around the house for the next few days without any more incidents with strangers and refrigerators. Shannon and me, we just chalked it up to the stress or something like that. Everything seemed to go back to normal. I had one more day off to go from my time off at work, and I knew just how I was going to spend it. By not doing anything. I don't think I'm going to even get out of bed. Shannon was at work. The kids were at my mom's house, and I woke up around noon. I never slept this late, and I noticed I had a big smile on my face. You don't know how rare it is when you're growing up, rest that is, because you get to do that when you're young. You get to rest all the time. Married and almost 40, you hardly ever get one second of your day that isn't planned out or scheduled. It's constant. It's sometimes brutal, and admittedly, I like it most of the time, the structure of a routine that is. Maybe I had been stressed out because I felt so good getting up from that deep sleep. Then I look over and my smile disappears. I saw the strange guy standing beside my bed. He was looking down at me. His head was held at an angle and he smiled at me with those weird finger-like teeth. 
You come with me need to, he said. I don't know. I was in utter despair. I had felt so good. Why was this guy ruining my life? Why was any of this happening? I was beyond mad. I was incensed. Get the hell away from me. Get the hell out of my house. I reached out to push the weird guy away and it was like trying to move a car with the parking brake on. I was at least a head taller and 50 pounds heavier than him, but he wouldn't budge. He didn't react to me attacking him at all. If he had eyelids, which I never saw any indication that he did, I don't think he would have even blinked. You come with me, need to, he said again. Who are you? What are you? I said. And he looked at me like he all of a sudden realized something that had never occurred to him before. I am, I was before who, and I what I am have been always. Oh, oh thanks for letting me know that, I laughed. Realizing he wasn't getting his messages across, he tried a different tact. You are, you were before you not, and you are not were supposed what you to be. I could swear there was some sort of pleading in his disgusting wet white disc that he tried to pass off his eyes. If there was supposed to have been some sort of understanding to have passed between us, it was beyond me. I had no idea what was going on. I dropped my head into my hands to think for a second. All I knew was that I wanted this guy out of my house and out of my life. So I decided if I can't beat him, I'll join him. At least that is until 5.30 before the wife and kids get home. What do you want me to do? I said. I raised my head and the guy was standing at the doorway like he was waiting for me to follow him. I got up from bed and I do just that. I followed him. When I reached the doorway, the guy's gone. Then I looked down the hallway and there he's at the stairs. Then he kept doing this. Every time I got near him, he would show up where I needed to go. Then I realized he was leading me into the basement. When I get to the kitchen, I saw him there at the top of the doorway to the basement. And then he disappeared. I walked over, looked down and he was there at the bottom of the steps waiting for me. Except for this time, he was not looking at me. It was like he reached the bottom of the stairs and he just decided to stop. He was staring straight forward facing the far wall. Then without looking at me, the weird guy raised his left arm and he pointed to his left. I went down the stairs warily, not sure what he had been pointing to when I reached the bottom of the steps. The guy was not there anymore. I looked to where he had been pointing and then I saw the refrigerator from my mom's basement. The refrigerator that had almost killed me when I was a child was now inside my house somehow. I heard the voice in my head. My brain absorbed thoughts and then I realized it was Kenny. Kenny had been the strange guy the whole time. At least in some weird, strange way, like everything else about Kenny, he let me know he couldn't walk around like a refrigerator, but he could walk around as a fetcher. That's what he called the strange guy that he had been, or what he had used as a vessel to communicate to me. Kenny let me know that he wanted me to climb back inside of him so we could finish our trip. I reminded Kenny that our trip hadn't gone so well the last time. Kenny let me know that there was a reason for that, but it was not his fault. Well, I wanted Kenny to let me know whose fault it was if it wasn't his. Kenny let me know it didn't matter because we needed to finish our journey. I let Kenny know that he could take a trip, a trip straight to hell, but I wasn't going anywhere with him. I walked back upstairs. I decided I would take the damn refrigerator, this cursed appliance, not back to my mom's house. No, I'll just get her a new one from where I work. This is it. I'm taking this thing to the dump to be rid of it forever. I would tell my mom that it was cathartic or something like that.
After some effort and a possible hernia, I finally loaded Kenny onto my truck. Then I saw my stepdad driving up in my driveway with my mom in the passenger seat. I could tell she had been crying. Oh, this should go swell. I knew it! My stepdad yelled as he jumped out of his truck. I knew you'd stole it, you crazy bastard! My mom got out of the truck. Barry, don't! She tried to reason with my stepdad. Look, I can explain, I said. Then my stepdad pushed me. What's wrong with you, Colder? Who in the hell steals from his own family? He pushed me again. Can you answer me that, you some bitch? First you break into my house, and then you steal my refrigerator. I could tell he had been drinking. It seemed me not being at home to fetch him his beers hadn't slowed his thirst down. My mom must have been getting them for him now. Easy, I said. I didn't steal the refrigerator. No, of course not. There's no way you could have done that. Oh, but wait. What do we got here in your truck? No, this ain't no refrigerator. Margaret, this here is just a, a dishwasher. Oh, crap. Well, damn if it isn't. It is. It's my refrigerator. But that can't be because Coda said that he didn't steal it. But here it is. What's going on? Is, is this me? Is this my life? And my stepdad waved his hands up in the air in an exaggerated motion. Look, if you must know, I was getting Mom a new refrigerator as a surprise. I lied. Sort of. My stepdad walked back up to me. He was starting to piss me off even if the circumstances were pretty damning. I could only take so much abuse, though. I'd taken enough abuse from this asshole in one lifetime. You listen here, Colder. My stepdad said. My name is Alex. Well, Alex, you listen up. You listen real good. This here, he pointed at the fridge. This here refrigerator doesn't get replaced by you because it's mine. And it's not your mom's. It's mine. Do you understand? It doesn't get replaced by anyone but me. You hear me, Alex? I wanted to smash his face in. I wanted to smash his face in, but I held back like I always do because my mom was standing right there. I didn't want to escalate the situation any further. And besides, he was right. It was his refrigerator, not mine. Even though I hadn't stole it, at least not willingly. I just admitted that I had. Well, I'm sorry, Barry. I didn't realize that the fridge meant that much to you. Well, now you know, Colder. And he got that smug little grin that showed his yellowing teeth from under that dust broom mustache he sported. We got the refrigerator unloaded from my truck. Then we loaded it back up onto Barry's truck. And my mom and Barry took it back to their house. Good. It was gone, that's all I wanted anyway. Before they had left, my mom apologized for Barry like she always did. If I had a penny for every time she had made an excuse up for him blowing up at me, I would never have to work another day for the rest of my life. Shannon came home with the boy. We ate, and we all went to bed. I didn't tell her about the refrigerator incident or Barry. I didn't want to worry about her any more than I already did. I guess I had been sleeping for a while when I suddenly woke up and I saw Jacob, my eight-year-old, standing beside my bed. Daddy? He said as he rubbed his eyes. Yeah, what is it, bud? Where's Joshua? Uh, he's sleeping, bud. He must have had a bad dream, that's all. Where? In his room. Your guy's room. Kids always worrying about nothing. But he's not there. I sit up. I'm awake now, and Jacob has my full attention. What do you mean? Josh, he's not there. I jumped out of bed, and I rushed inside the boy's room. Jacob was right. 
Josh, my youngest, he's not inside of their room. Then where the hell is he exactly? Shannon came around the corner and she stood inside the doorway of the boy's bedroom. What's going on? Where's Josh? Said Shannon. I don't know, but it's okay. We're going to find him, I said. Did they believe that? I hope so, because my heart that was pumping my body full of adrenaline wasn't so sure. Jacob, what happened? Did you see where your brother went? No, I woke up to go to the bathroom and he wasn't there. We searched the entire house. We called out Josh's name. We looked everywhere and then I saw him. The weird guy was there. He was standing at the top of the steps of the basement. No, is all I can manage. No, 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 no! I screamed inside my head. I went over to the kitchen door that led down into the basement, and the weird guy disappeared as soon as I reached the door. I rushed down the stairs and there was Josh, who just stared at the wall where the refrigerator had been earlier today. Josh! I yelled out in relief. I hugged him, but he didn't hug me back. I turned him to look at me. His limbs were completely poseable, like a mannequin's except for his head. He still just stared out at the wall in a trance-like state, seemingly unaware or completely ignoring my presence. Josh, what's going on? Man, you gave us a scare. Daddy, go you to there. Josh said. What? Go you to there? And he pointed towards the wall. I looked back and I didn't see anything, but then I did. It was like a film projector burning an image onto the wall from the other side. It was this futuristic purple metallic city. Just like the one that I had seen the first time I met Kenny. So beautiful, like, go I? Josh said. Then I saw the strange guy there, the Fetcher. I think that's what Kenny had called it. And he just looked at Josh and me. As he moved his mouth, my son Josh said exactly what he said. You need to go to I go make you sometime soon, said the Fetcher and Josh at the same time. You bastard, I said to the Fetcher. Go or not do, but go you, son, instead go. That like will you? I got it. It was just good plain old-fashioned blackmail. I guess no matter what universe you're in, if you care about somebody, it can be used against you. The message was pretty clear. If I didn't go back with him, back inside the refrigerator, Kenny, he was going to take my kid, or somebody else I cared about, in my place. <laughs> Fine. I'll go. Are you happy now? I'll go. Just... Just leave my family alone, I said. The Fetcher smiled his weird finger-like tooth smile, and he stepped back into the shadows and just seemed to disappear. The vision of the futuristic city disappeared too, and then I heard Josh. Dad? Yeah, but it's me. I turned him in my arms so I could look at him. He looked fine. He looked normal again. I noticed all of a sudden that I was crying, but they were tears of relief instead of fear. Shannon and Jacob came downstairs and none of us said anything for a while. We all just hugged. It was one of the nicest moments of my entire life, as well as one of the worst, because I felt like this was the last time I would probably ever get to be with my family like this again. Everyone went back to bed, everyone but me. How could I sleep knowing what I had to do next? I wrote Shannon a note, and I told her the truth about what had been going on with the refrigerator, Kenny, and the Fetcher. I'm sure everyone would believe I had had some sort of psychotic break after it was all said and done. Who knows? Maybe they would be right. Guess we'll find out. But at least with the note, the boys will know. Shannon will know. I did this for them. They'll know that I hadn't just killed myself in the refrigerator just to kill myself. No. 
They'll know what I did, in my crazy delusional mind anyway, was in an attempt to save them all. I went over to my mom's and Barry's place around 2 a.m. The window to the back door of the house had a piece of cardboard over it from where I had broken the window pane to get inside the other night. I pushed the cardboard in. It was only taped there with some duct tape. Then I reached in, turned the key in the deadbolt from the inside, and I let myself in. It was a full moon, and the light shining in from the outside made it easy to see inside the basement. Even with the lights off, it didn't matter either way. I knew that basement inside and out. I could have walked it blindfolded if I had to. I closed the door, and there it was, the refrigerator. Kenny. I looked around, and I didn't see the fetcher anywhere. Then I walked over opened up the fridge and I was surprised to discover that it was not cold inside of the fridge and there was no light emanating from out of the bottom portion of it. There was also no giant eyeball encased in a big block of ice inside the freezer. I closed the door and then I looked around at the back of it and I saw that the fridge was not plugged in. I knelt to plug the refrigerator back in when I suddenly heard the sound of a shotgun being racked. A chill ran up my spine because I knew who it was. Barry. <laughs> I knew he'd be back, you crazy some bitch. I stood up and saw Barry pointing the shotgun right at me. Ah, uh, yep. Get them hands up, boy. I raised my hand. Barry, this isn't necessary. No, see, I disagree. I say this is very necessary. And Barry walked over and pointed the shotgun right up to my face. What are you doing? I sputter. I'm probably gonna blow your damn head off. Hmm. That's what I'm more than likely gonna do, you piece of shit. He wasn't kidding. I could see it in his eyes. Yeah, you're going to kill me over a refrigerator? No, I'm gonna kill you because I've wanted you dead from the first day I met you. I don't know what to say. It was all so confusing. What? Barry just laughed. <laughs> Man, you mean you don't know? I thought you figured it out messing around with the refrigerator again after all this time. <laughs> I just look at him confused as ever. He took the gun away from my face slowly, and then Barry swept his leg over a nearby wooden chair in dramatic fashion. Then he sat on the chair and leaned his chest against the chair's back. He kept the shotgun leveled at my chest the whole time. Then he just sat there and looked at me with a smug smile on his face. <sighs> you know I was in Nam. I was there for two tours of duty. And then I eventually made my way back here. Oh, great. It was Barry's famous I was in Nam speech. Wish he'd just pulled the trigger and get it over with. At least it would be less painful. Oh, that's right. You don't like to hear my story about Nam, do you, boy? Yeah, you and your kind had never had to do anything like that. Get to sit around all day and take for granted everything that we did and piss it all away. Hmm. <laughs> well, you gonna listen to this because it concerns you. And we all know how sport kid like you get all of a sudden interested in things once it has something to do with them. Now don't we? Barry, let's just talk about- Shut up. I'm talking here, you asshole. But then, you never listen, do you? You think you so smart, so clever, that anything I have to say, well, 
It doesn't matter. Well, you weren't so clever when you almost ended up dead in that refrigerator, were you now? <laughs> you still don't know how you ended up inside that refrigerator. <laughs> but I do. And if you would just shut the fuck up for once in your life, I'm going to tell you how. So I did. I shut the fuck up for once in my life. When I got back from Nam, I was in and out of the VA hospital. That's where I met your mama. Pretty thing she was. Your daddy had died and she was having a rough time of it. So I asked her out and we started dating. Everything was perfect. And then that's when I found out about you. I hated you. From the first time I ever set eyes on you, I could barely stand to look at you. But I thought to myself, you got a good woman here, Barry. Don't go messing this up as much as you do with everything else in your life. As he talked, it was like I wasn't even inside the room. His shotgun started to drift downward. Maybe this could be my chance. Then Barry must have sensed what I was thinking, and he leveled the shotgun back up at my chest, and he steeled his features in my direction again. Well, you know what happened next. Your mama and I got hitched, and I tried to make it work. I tried to be a good stepdad to you, even though I couldn't stand a thought, much less the sight of you. But you were always going on about your daddy this, your daddy that, and I could tell that every time you did that, you just upset your mama so badly. But you made a mistake. Because when you upset your mama, you made me upset too. You see, Colder, every time you opened your damn mouth about your damn daddy, I could see the pain well up in your mama's eyes. And you see, the thing is, what I didn't know was, was when she looked like that, was that her just a feeling bad for her little boy? Or was it because she was still in love with a dead man six feet in the ground? Do you know what that's like, Colder? Do you know what it's like to live in the shadow of another man's life? I wasn't sure if the question was rhetorical or not, but the man holding the shotgun at my chest told me to shut up, so I went with it. Turns out I was right. No, you don't know what that's like, but I do. I knew it every damn time you had to bring your dead daddy up again. So, I had had enough. And I remember that there was this drug that one of my buddies had told me about that those black pajama-wearing bastards used to use on the POWs. Yeah, it's called Melanthrol. Hmm. Completely illegal in the state. Hard as fuck to get. What it did is it made it so you could interrogate a prisoner where they could feel all the pain but it froze the body to where they couldn't move, except for their mouths for some reason. Yeah, it also kind of put them in a partially, one of them, uh, uh, what you call it, one of them hallucinogenic states. That's it, that's it, hmm. The best part is it's nearly untraceable in the system after it's been used. <laughs> My eyes widened at this. Yep, so my buddy owed me a favor, and he got me some. That day you got trapped in the fridge over there. Barry nodded to Kenny. I had fixed your lung, and I had put some melanthrol inside the sandwich I fixed for you. Yeah, then I asked you to go fetch me a beer. Figured it had been enough time to go through your system. Funny thing was... Even in your messed up condition, you were talking about, can I go see my daddy? You take me to my daddy? <laughs> I'm pissed at his casual attitude about almost killing me. 
and I started to walk towards him. Ah, easy, Colder, said Barry, and he raised his shotgun with both hands. No need to get shot right now. You're going to die soon enough, trust me. I'm almost done here. I stepped back to where I was standing before. Barry was too far away for me to get to him without him pulling the trigger first anyway. One blast from that shotgun and what was left of me would be sliding down Kenny in red clumps. Hey, well, now you know the rest of it. <laughs> That's what happened. I put you in the fridge to die. But then your mama come home early that day and had to go and mess the whole damn thing up. You see, she had forgotten her key that particular day and couldn't get into the house from the front. I wasn't home to let her in because I had walked over to the store to fetch some beer so I would have an excuse as to why I wasn't there when you got inside the fridge. <laughs> he was so proud of himself, thinking of everything. <laughs> so your mama, she broke into the window of the back door, just like you did the other night to let herself in. She knew I'd be pissed off about breaking the window, and so she decided to grab me a cold one from the damn refrigerator. Just figured I was passed out in my chair when I hadn't answered the door. And that's when she found you, and she called the paramedics. <laughs> I thought I was done for when I was walking back home and found out you were still alive. <laughs> but then you come up with your crazy ass story about that stupid eyeball thing in the freezer and the other dimensions going to see your dad and shit. And well, that just saved my ass from any attention from being flung in my direction. <laughs> And then I saw a pair of wide orbs floating in the darkness, and I realized that it was the Fetcher. He was standing right behind Barry. Barry followed the direction of my gaze. What the hell you looking at? He looked back right at the Fetcher, then back at me. Ah, you see things there, don't you, boy? Said Barry mockingly. There ain't nothing there. You know that, don't you? You one crazy son bitch. There was always something not right about you, Colder. Well, enough of this guy. I think I knew everything now. Mom! I yelled. Mom, it's me! Come down here! Then I smiled at Barry confidently. Barry looked back over to the stairs, then back to me, and shook his head in disgust. You think you're pretty smart, don't you? Well, sorry to spoil your little plan, but I still have some melanthrol there. Use it all the time when I need to go out and do something and your mama gives me some lip about it. Your mom's sound asleep on the stuff. Hell, she might even be late for work tomorrow. <laughs> Barry got an angry look on his face, and then he kicked the chair that he was sitting on out from underneath him. All right, enough talking. Time to get this over with. And Barry aimed a shotgun at my head. Yeah, I'm going to enjoy this. Go ahead, open it up. What? Open the damn refrigerator up and get inside. Why? So you'll die. Except for this time, I'm standing here and I'm going to watch that door to make sure you don't ever, ever come back out again. At least until you're dead, that is, said Barry with a smirk, and he motioned with the shotgun for me to move towards Kenny. The fetcher just stood there the whole time watching and finally said, We go take man this instead. I don't know what the fetcher was talking about like usual, but my mind raced for anything to stall Barry. The fridge, it's unplugged, I said desperately looking over my shoulder. Ah, thanks for telling me. I'll get it later. He motioned with his shotgun to move forward. Look on the bright side, Colder. At least you won't be cold when you're in there. 
We both know how you hate that. Now, get inside the damn fridge. The fetcher walked in front of Barry, who still didn't seem to see him. We go, take man, this instead. And the fetcher pointed at Barry. Go, now, Barry yelled. I'm losing my patience with you. I reached the door, and I started to open it. And I began to see a light come out from the fridge as it opened. I think you're so smart, college boy. Thought you said that fridge was unplugged. Good, he saw it too. Maybe I wasn't so crazy after all. So I opened up the fridge and jumped to the side, shielding myself with the door. Ah! And that intense light that glared out from the fridge back when I was a kid was a thousandfold in the darkness. Barry screamed out in surprise and fired both barrels of the shotgun. But I was behind the refrigerator door and I was not hurt by the shotgun blast. I jumped out from behind the refrigerator door, screamed, and rushed towards Barry. I tackled him with my full weight landed on top of him and I just started beating his face into the ground. I hit him the way you hit someone you've wanted to hit your entire life. Hard and with a suppressed rage that felt good to unleash on an enemy after so much time. I hit Barry, connecting as hard as I could at least three times on the face. I think I heard his nose break on the third punch. Then Barry dodged my next blow and my fist hit the concrete floor. I screamed out in pain. I think I broke at least two fingers and Barry took his shot while I was distracted with my pain. He hit me as hard as he could in the stomach. I toppled over in ridiculous mind-numbing agony. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, Barry stood up and kicked me twice more in the stomach. It was impossible to focus because you think you've had the worst pain you were ever going to experience with the first blow, only to be proven wrong twice more from the subsequent blows. I laid there on the floor, unable to move. The beams from the fridge were so intense, Barry just looked like a moving silhouette, and I couldn't distinguish his features, but I could hear his voice. Mm. Not bad, Colda. Mm. Not bad at all. <laughs> then he kicked me two more times in the gut with his boot. I think I blacked out for a second or two from shock. <sighs> well, not good enough, though. And he grabbed my feet and started to pull me towards the fridge. As I was being pulled, I saw the drain that was in the middle of the floor. The one where my blood had been flowing down into just the other night. I flipped the small drain cover and played out, and I embedded my fingers inside the hole in the ground. I had to use my left hand because my right hand was so badly injured. Barry kept pulling, but we didn't move forward. Each time he pulled at my legs, it stretched my stomach out and shot pain throughout my body. But I had a firm grip on the drain opening. And then Barry saw what I was doing. He laughed. <laughs> yeah, you're really showing me something here, Colda. Yeah, maybe if I knew you had such survival instincts, we could have gotten along better. Yeah. I looked up and I saw the fetcher there. It looked at me with its wet white moon eyes. We go take man this instead. Then all reality shifted, and the world turned vertical. And suddenly I was hanging from the hole in the ground, and the light from behind me exploding out from the refrigerator was sucking all reality in from behind me and downward into Kenny. I felt something grab my leg. I looked down, and it was Barry. <sighs> What the fuck is going on? I barely heard him. The sound of all reality going down and into the fridge was so loud and forceful that it was hard to hear what he said. Barry's added weight was too much for me to hold on to the drainage opening. My fingers started to slip out. 
I was trying to focus all my thoughts onto holding on to that one last bit of reality. The last thing that I felt was real, but the pain from where Barry had kicked me made it too hard to focus. My fingers didn't hold. I began to fall, and with it went my last connection with the world I used to know. Then I felt a hand grab mine. It was the Fetcher. He looked at me with this strange, horrific face, but at that moment in time, it was the most welcome sight I had ever seen. I couldn't tell what he was holding on to that was allowing him to just stand there. Somehow, the mini black hole that the refrigerator was creating from below was not affecting him. The suction from the refrigerator continued and grew stronger. Barry was still holding on to my leg, refusing to let go. Suddenly, his features started to stretch, distorting towards the direction of the refrigerator. The suction from the fridge continually got stronger with each passing second. I didn't know how much longer I could hold on to the Fetcher's hand. Suddenly, Barry screamed out. His features, his soul, whatever the essence was of this thing called life, peeled out layer by layer from his being. Barry's fingers, which were worn down to a skeletal state by now, eventually lost their grip from my leg. In an instant, his body exploded and then dispersed into ash, and what remained of Barry got sucked inside the refrigerator. As soon as what was left of Barry hit the inside of the fridge, a thin light pierced the seams of the door as it shut, and then there was a muffled explosion from within the refrigerator. Then reality rearranged itself back to normal, and the world was horizontal and level again. I was standing there with my hands out, and I looked to thank the Fetcher, but he was gone. I hobbled over to the fridge holding my stomach, and I opened it up. It was empty. Somehow inside myself, I knew it was all finally over. I would never see Barry, Kenny, or to fetch her again. I don't know how I knew this, but I did. I walked over to the back of the refrigerator and I saw that it was still unplugged. I don't know why in the world I did it, but I plugged the refrigerator's cord into the wall socket and I felt the cold air start to flow as it began to cool the fridge. I left the door open and stood in front of the refrigerator letting the cool air hit my skin. You know what? It felt good. And that was Colder by C.L. Horton. A tale of trauma. A tale of redemption. A good reminder not to climb inside the refrigerator. Not to belabor the point, but have only licensed and qualified personnel service your kitchen appliances. A little about the author. Lee Horton is a graduate of Savannah College of Art and Design, where he received his MFA in sequential art. While an artist, he considers himself first and foremost a storyteller. He created the fantasy story Hourglass Falls on Zuda, and the horror comic book, Pain and Graves, through beautiful, silly, and terrible things digital comics, both of which he wrote and did the art for. Pain and Graves can be found currently on Comixology. Lee's currently working on finishing his novel, Maximus Veritas vs. the Time Thieves, and his short story anthology, Marilyn Monroe, M16s, and Time Machines. You can check out some of Lee's comic art on his Instagram at wall underscore crawler one. Thanks, Lee. Hey, do me a favor, would you? Subscribe to this podcast wherever you do your listening and leave me a five-star review and maybe a kind word there, even if you're listening on YouTube. I need soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and I appreciate it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of your screen. 
you'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases. All of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Stop on by, would you? I don't bite much. And remember, we are accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, wash, wax, and polish. Maybe even a little true coat on your undercarriage. <laughs> Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So fetch a drink for the road, friend. It's right there in the fridge, just next to the frozen eyeball there. This week I'd like to recognize a couple of our lovely ladies, Linda Beaumont and Nora Paquette. I enjoy your kind words, and as always, thanks for listening. You are appreciated. So may the wind be at your back, may the road rise up to meet you, and in honor of National Cocktail Day, go fuck yourself. I know I will. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark.